Hey, hey. how's it going? <laughs> it's going great, thank you. Aren't you always amazed when this works? I'm, I'm amazed every <laughs> single time, no matter the platform. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining us. I'm yeah, in London, you are in, I think, New York City. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. I am delighted today to be joined by LinkedIn's editor-at-large, Caroline Fairchild. She is a leading expert on the trends and issues facing the future of work and diversity in the workplace. So I am very excited to be speaking with her about the future of work for women and women at work right now. She hosts and also writes uh, Working Together, which is LinkedIn's live show, which I think she's doing from home at the moment, and looking very glamorous with it. And a newsletter with more than 100,000 subscribers, uh, focus on the changing face of US business. So we're going to talk global today. And before working with LinkedIn, Caroline was the business reporter at Fortune magazine and also founded The Broadsheet, a popular daily newsletter on women in business. So she knows her stuff. She has interviewed some of the world's most successful um, business leaders, including Melinda Gates, Sheryl Sandberg, and Warren Buffett, and me. And she yeah, was Debbie, on and on Debbie to that list for sure. <laughs> in that company she was honored <laughs> on the um, infamous eponymous uh forbes 30 under 30 list uh the year before last as one of the brightest young minds working in the media caroline welcome thank you um, a quick note on housekeeping before we get going please do share your questions through the comment box and we will get do our best to get through them all um on this um all by instagram live right caroline um so to start bigger picture we are all facing a very uncertain time right now um and we're worried about health families the economy our jobs um although um we hope there are lots of reasons to be optimistic for a hopeful future can you frame the impact that covid19 is having on women and girls in their work. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Debbie, thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy our conversations and it's fun to do this on Instagram instead of LinkedIn where we've, we've done this before. So <laughs> thanks for having me. So I think there are zooming way out and then we can zoom in at some point, but I think zooming way out, there are two important topics to discuss when we think about how COVID-19 is impacting women in particular. There's the essential worker angle, and then there's the women who are working from home right now and that angle and what that reality looks like. So we know that when it comes to essential workers right now, over-indexed female. So yeah. if you think about the industries that are uh, high risk for contracting COVID-19 right now and are still essential, uh, retail, hospitality, these are, these are you know, industries that are very high in the percentage of women that are working in them. Healthcare is a big one. We know that nurses are indexing much higher when it comes to female representation. So there's a lot to talk about there in terms of the outsized risk that women are being put in right now and asked and expected to go to work, particularly women of color. If you think about those essential retail jobs, there are over-indexed in women of color and also uh, nursing as well. So, and home health care aids is another big one. So that's a big topic when we're thinking about the gender lens for COVID-19. And then the other big one that we need to talk about is uh, women who are working from home. Yeah. So, and what that looks like, and the with school closures rampant across uh, many countries, what that looks like for women who are now having to do outsized work, both doing their day jobs, but then also uh, homeschooling, and the the stress that women are feeling there. So, I think those are kind of the two big buckets that we could dive into and in, on in this conversation. Do we pick the the latter topic first, if you like, because our Albright audience. Our smart-minded, ambitious women is how we describe them across the globe. Um, and they range massively in terms of what they do and how they live and where they live. Um, but one of the things that they often all have in common is trying to figure out and juggle and look for balance and find a way through in very real situations. And this is very real. And I speak as someone who's got three children at home at the moment and the, my other half is a surgeon so he's in the ICU you know it's it's a lot um trying to unpick that in more detail talk a little bit about mental load um which is something that we think and talk about at Albright and, and the stat that we often use is that women are 1.9 times more likely than men i.e almost twice as likely 
as men to have to deal with the mental load of the house. And in my house at the moment, I feel that that has gone off the chart to about 20 times as much because I've got my whole new range of roles alongside being the co-founder of Albright because I'm IT help desk when the kids' laptops aren't working with homeschooling. I'm, I'm, I'm everything. Right. Um, talk us through that a bit and, and why that matters and why it matters more than ever right now. It matters hugely. So if you think about pre-COVID-19, we did a survey of working parents and found that working mothers are just afraid of talking about the fact that they have kids and other responsibilities in the home for fear that that mental load that you just described, Debbie, will impact their careers negatively. They don't want to let their boss know that they that they have kids. It sounds, it sounds silly when you say it out loud, but there are a lot of working mothers who downplay the fact that they do have this huge mental load that they are required to bear at home, both bearing kids, both rearing kids, but also with household chores. We know that women are two and a half times more likely to be doing household chores and be responsible for the execution of that than men. So they've been, if you think about going into the office and being able to hide that, you then put us into the COVID-19 world where, hello, we're, we're all in each other's homes now. And those yeah. kids that you've been trying to downplay so that you can make sure that you get that promotion, yeah. or that your manager knows that you're really committed to work, is in the Zoom call. Yeah, in the you. back of the call. Right. Yes. Or on the and Instagram live. Exactly. And we're hearing from a lot of working mothers that that is just increasing the stress that they're feeling right now at work. And, you know, the best managers are those who are really being empathetic and changing the way that they lead in this time. And rather than, you know, it, it's been, it, it was easier pre-COVID to not have these transparent conversations around what's happening in your world and what's happening at home and keeping the conversations that you're having at what, about work and what you're doing with work. And now almost every manager who has a remote team is having to say, how's your family doing? How are your kids? How are you balancing? Do we need to change your hours so that you can work more flexibly in homeschool? And I think coming out of this, what you'll see is that the best companies are the companies who are going to have done that, are the companies who are, have been leading empathetically and transparently during this time and have accepted the fact that this is a new normal and you can't just talk about work at work. And, you know, if you happen to be at a company that isn't that situation right now, we're gonna, they're going to see a lot of talent leave after this. We've seen a lot of working parents, you know, telling us on LinkedIn that, they don't, they're not being supported by their manager. Their manager is not asking them how homeschooling is going. And they're likely going to lose a lot of good talent coming out of this. What does leadership look like? And what should it look like in a time of unbelievable change? I'm asking for a friend, ha ha. No, but you know, <laughs> at Albright, as you know, if you've talked about it in the past, we have a very particular set up. We employ majority women, women around the world. We're both mothers. We talk <laughs> front and center about what we need to do, how we do it, how we do it as a team. But um, it is different doing it on Zoom or on Microsoft Teams. Or So what, what does leadership look like? And what is a new era for leadership um, post COVID-19? Well, Debbie, I should ask you this, and I have asked you this in interviews uh -huh. that we had a couple weeks ago. You should answer yeah. your own question. But look, what I'll say is in, in conversations with CEOs that I've had in the past eight weeks, it's been eight weeks since I've been working remotely, is it, it really is a, an entire shift in the paradigm of what we consider to be a successful leader. If you go back to the Mad Men era and you think about that archetype of the strong, decisive, stoic, typically white male leader who makes decisions and doesn't have emotions and is you know very strong you can't lead like that successfully during a global pandemic. And so what I'm hopeful for coming out of this is that the leadership traits that we know uh, skew typically more female empathy, transparency, ability to you know show emotion in a way that is uh, is just responsive to what's what's going on with your business and with your customers those traits i think are going to be in higher demand coming out of this crisis and i think the best leaders are those who are you know like we discussed and you know when i spoke with you a couple weeks ago really being transparent in communication and admitting when they don't know the answer which is really challenging for a lot of ceos i spoke to many ceos who have said it's you know it almost seems counterintuitive for me to tell my employees when they have a question you know we don't know we, know the answer. we don't know yeah. the answer mm -hmm. um, but i think 
that is the type of leadership that people are really responding to right now in this crisis. And then, yeah, empathy is huge. Understanding that you, you, the situations that we're all in, we're not just in this Zoom box. We have these whole lives behind us now. Uh, and, and being communicative about what those needs are for your employees. Can we talk a little bit about flexible working and working from home? I saw that we had a question um, on the screen about that. So again, one of the stats that we often use is that in the UK, 40% of women who work are working part-time or flexibly. And what I think that means in a time of pand pandemic is inevitably we are going to be disproportionately affected mm. because um, those roles are often not as secure. And right. the flip of that, I think, talking to our all right audiences, the, the positivity in all of this is actually, we are doing it, right? We're all doing it. We're showing yeah. that we can do that thing that often has been not available to women because mm -hmm. um, sometimes I think women find it in the same way as they find it hard to talk about their kids the working from home or flexible work challenge in a conversation with a potential employer is really hard. So frame that home working flexibility, part-time freelance part of the debate for me. Right. Well, Debbie, you've read the studies just as I have, as you know, when we think about the pre COVID era, Yes, there are companies that offer flexible work, but the stigma around asking for that isn't going to go away until it's not just the women and the working mothers who are asking for it, and it's everyone that's asking for it. And there were some really good data points before the pandemic started around that. Millennials, regardless of gender, really want flexible work, and so there's some generational tides that are pulling the momentum that could really be a boon for working mothers who've been asking for this for, you know, generations. Yeah. Um, so that was positive pre-COVID, and then, you know, overnight, companies had to switch all of their employees to remote work. And I think that there are, there's really two outcomes that can come of this. The positive one is that man, individual managers are going to be able to see, oh, wow, both Bob and Jane are able to work from home successfully. And I'm judging them on their output and their performance, not when they're doing their work. Right. And not the fact that Bob is in at nine and, you know, Susie has to leave at five because she has to pick up her kids. And so that's the positive outcome is that we could really see a mind shift change in terms of what success looks like. And that could be a boon for women. This, the danger, the danger here is that if we aren't, if leaders aren't leading transparently and empathetically and not seeing the fact that, yes, it's challenging for working parents right now to be performing at the highest level because of the mental load of what they're doing in the home and judging them on that and then taking that prejudice back with them when we do all get back to work. I that this is what flexible work looks like, right? Yes. It looks like the, the, child in the corner of the shot or the yeah agreed right so it really is i think i want to stay positive when i when i you know i think my my what i'm when i speak to leaders I feel like it's going to be the former. I'm hoping it's going to be the former. Uh, but there really is, if we're not being really diligent about how individual managers, how executives are responding in this time to this remote environment, that it could go the other way. Uh, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, if I had a crystal ball, I, I would love to predict it would be the former, but it very much could be the latter as well. How is it for you doing your thing from home? Oh, how does uh, that even work? I keep telling my friends, I, I feel like I went through like the seven stages of grief with this whole pandemic. I first was in denial with our producers. I was just joking with, uh, so I post a daily live show on LinkedIn called Business Unusual, where we're talking about how coronavirus is impacting the ways that we all work. And the day before this all happened, I was in this video studio in the Empire State Building with my producer, figuring out how we could do this from the studio, like if I, I, we still thought we, would be, we were gonna be able to go into the right. office. right? And then literally 12 hours later, after we sketched out a set and the you know workflow for the show, we get an email and it's all remote. And so we all had to figure out in real time how to do this remotely. And you know, I, I was really, as I'm sure we all were at the beginning of this, so hard on myself. I was like, this is so clunky and the tech isn't working and my, my shot isn't right. And then I just realized this is the new normal and the new right. world order. And I have to take the same advice that I'm hearing from executives about being empathetic with yourself, but also leaning empathetically right now and, you know, not being so rough on like what the show actually looks like. Uh, but it's been, it's been fun. 
Um, okay, so to move on a little bit um, and to talk about gender pay gap mm. um, and, and one, I, I think what we're trying to really figure out is how do we use the pandemic as an opportunity for change for women? And what is the positive next step that we can all take and encourage each other as a sisterhood to support around? And I know it's something that you have written about and thought about a lot. So just reflect on that a little bit. And again, just some sort of riffing, if you like, on, on what you think the future looks like for how women work and get paid to work. Sure. So yeah, you know, gender equal pay day came and went, you know, last month uh, with little hoorah because there's a global pandemic going on. And <laughs> yeah, I, uh, it wasn't very much marked. Yeah, and I spoke with Sally Krawcheck about that recently, uh, and she, you know, we were just talking about, you know, there there really is an opportunity here for companies to be really strategic and also tracking what's happening with their workforce during this time. Yeah. Uh, we need to ensure that if companies are making decisions about, uh, you know, there are a lot of industries that are, you know, having, pay, having uh, workers take pay cuts right now. What is the demographic of the population of your workforce that is asked to take that pay cut? Is it equal? Is it diverse? Or is it skewing more heavily towards women? Uh, so that I think in terms of when we think about the wealth of women right now, that's really important. I also think that, you know, in, you know, we know that there's a, a gender, there's a gender wealth gap, right? Women are, are less likely to have uh, significant savings, and they're less likely to be investing their money. And I think right now is a really an opportunity for women to be thinking strategically, particularly given that we're probably going to be in this recession for quite some time, how they're investing their money and kind of what they're what they're doing there. I think that that's something that's that's really important. Give us and your for, top tips <laughs> on that, because we've had quite a few different financial experts talking about women and money and what women should be doing with their money right now. If you had to give three bits of advice, what would they be? Well, I'm not a financial expert. <laughs> but what I will say is I think it's really important for women to, you know, think about, you know, what their what their what their goals are coming out of this crisis. And is there a way that they can invest their money uh, you know, I, the biggest thing that uh, the question we've been getting on LinkedIn is like, should I take money out of my 401k? And I think my biggest piece of advice there is just don't look at your 401k right now. It's not going to be very pretty, right. but it's leave the happening. money where it is. And then, you know, I, I can only speak personally, you know, right now, my husband and I are thinking about whether we should buy a home and is that the right thing to be doing right now in a recession? And I think it really just depends on, you know, do you have the runway capital and how secure you are in your job right now? Uh, that I think is, is, is critical. How, how secure are you that, you know, how has the communication been with your company about, you know, how secure you are with work? So obviously it's, it's very case by case, but I think having a hold of what you want your, your wealth to look like coming out of this is really important and uh, understanding that all of the turbulence that we're seeing in the markets right now, it's going to go away once the economy uh, get, is allowed to reopen and move forward. Um, just to reflect on that a little bit and what we are going to see as economic consequence over the next months, um, one of the biggest factors obviously being unemployment and a, mm -hmm. and a massive rise in global unemployment. Um, let's just talk and think about that from a female perspective mm -hmm. and, and given that you are the editor at LinkedIn, um, where you are experts on connection, network, and jobs and work. Yeah. Um, what, how should we be thinking about that? What should women be doing? How can we equip ourselves to be best ready for a new world of a new job market? Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's no understating the devastating impact that the coronavirus has had on the job market right now. And the jobless claims are, you know, just historic records across, you know, many countries right now. So I, I think that right now is really an opportunity if you happen to be in a position right now if you're, you're listening to the to the you know instagram live right now and you happen to have lost your job i think i would say a few things one is that you know i've been speaking to a, a, a lot of people who have been furloughed or laid off who are trying to compare what's happening right now to the last recession yes. and i think it's important to note that this is a recession all of it's all on its own and when i speak with employers when i speak speak with hiring managers they are 
eager to get positions back into the marketplace. And also, it's, it's important to note, yes, there are some industries, hospitality, uh, leisure, retail, that are not hiring right now. But there are a lot of industries that are hiring right now. If you think about healthcare, healthcare job listings on LinkedIn are up 35% right now. Uh, another big one is consulting. Tech is hiring too right now. There's a lot of tech jobs that obviously can be done remotely. And so we're seeing an uptick in those positions as well. So my first tip would be, you might have to be a little bit strategic and adaptable about what kind of opportunities you're looking for right now. Is there a way that you can get an experience in say another industry that you haven't considered before, but that you can get some skills while you're in that position, even if it's for a temporary basis, that you can then apply to get you back on track once the economy opens up into whatever you, you thought was gonna be your career path. I think the number one trait that hiring managers and executives are gonna look for in people that they hire coming out of this crisis is adaptability. And they're gonna be asking people, how did you spend your time during this crisis? And if you have a good story about, you know, I really wanted to market in retail, but the companies that I was interested in weren't hiring. So I worked, I went to this, uh, I took this job at a hospital in a marketing role, and this is what I did. That shows perseverance, that shows adaptability, that shows agility. These are all traits that I think coming out of this, people are going to be looking for. The other thing is, this is a great time to brush up on new skills. This is a great time that if you have like some, some goal three to five years out in your career, but you don't have the skills necessarily to accomplish that or get that position that you want, there are many platforms, LinkedIn Learning being one of them, that are offering a lot of free content right now. And when we're all working from home, you know, it's, it's easy to slip you know, at the end of the day into a glass of wine, but maybe spend that time instead with a 30 minute course that you can then you know, apply and start Start learning things that when we do get out of this crisis will make you a more attractive candidate yeah great advice and the same goes for all of the albright academy content and everything that we have online yes. um can we just i want to reflect a little bit um because you're such an expert on the world of work on the emotional mm. consequences of being made redundant being furloughed being let go that i know can make people feel ashamed or embarrassed and at the very least not your confidence what would your advice be to our listeners who are feeling like that who are in that situation yeah but before this crisis began i was doing a lot of reporting on just how close all of our identities have now become with our work uh you know it's almost as if work is the new religion for a lot of workers and they are so i i put myself in this bucket uh, and I've tried to pull myself out of it many times, but I'm always slipping back in to this thought that, you know, your career and your work and what you how you perform at work is, is who you are. Uh, and there are many reasons why for your mental health that isn't great. Um, I got a puppy last week to try and like help with that, you know, trying to figure out some other things yeah. that I can kind of bolster my identity with. But I think in terms of advice, if you if you have lost your job and that huge part of your identity is uh, is gone, I think it's really important to to give your time yourself the time and space to mourn. We've seen a lot of experts writing on LinkedIn about you really need to give your time the, yourself the time to process the fact that this huge part of your life is now gone and it's you know it, it is a, it's a form of grieving that you need to give yourself time to do and be um, empathetic and okay with yourself to do that i think also you know once you've gone through that grieving process then it's really an opportunity of spending time to sketch out what exactly it is that you want your next play to be and taking small steps every day to getting there. Uh, it may be just, you know, writing down free writing. I do it when I'm, when I'm stressed out or there are things going on in my life. I do a lot of free writing where I try and figure out, you know, just, just take out a pen and try and figure out what the next step should be. And so if you feel lost, if you feel confused, small things every day, you know, looking up, looking up, you know, if, if there's a place you want to be in your career, going on to LinkedIn and trying to see, go see where someone who you aspire to be, how they got there, what kind of uh, background that they have and trying to piecemeal. And then this is really a great time to network. I don't know about you, Debbie, but every time I, I email someone or call someone and say, hey, do you want to do this People show? Or time do you to reply. Yeah, yeah, everyone's like, I, 
I, I'm there. What time do you need me? Yeah. <laughs> so everyone yeah. is at home. And I do think that even though we are all siloed in our individual homes right now, we are all going through this together. And I'm, I'm feeling this overwhelming sense of wanting to help right now from, from everyone in my network. So if you just reach out and start reaching out to your network, even if you don't have a direct ask, but just want to field some questions, I think you'll be surprised at the response that you'll get back. Let's just pick up on that topic of networking, um, which is something that uh, women sometimes struggle with and don't always enjoy. Men too, I'm sure. But um, when Anna and I had our book out last year, Believe, Build, Become, we talked a lot about that, about how do you network? It's one of the reasons that we set up Albright and we try to bring together this monster global sisterhood of awesome women and to make it easier for women to connect. In this time where we're in our homes, but we're always on, how do we do it? Um, how do we make it right for this every email that you receive at the moment begins with, I hope you and your family are okay. That, that, what's the right way of framing build using this opportunity to build your network and how should we do it? Yeah, I think a lot of the lesson, a lot hasn't changed around networking right now, right? Even though we are in this situation where we're all at home and you're, you know, all of your communication is digital to, to a certain extent. My phone is about to die. This is very bad. I'm wandering over to my power. <laughs> it's fine. Right. I'll take care of it. I'll walk us through. <laughs> um, I'm, I keep being afraid that my phone's going to like fall down. I have it propped okay. up on my lap. So, um, this is my so living room. What I, would say, <laughs> what I would say in terms of networking is it's really important right now to uh, just, yeah, like you said, being really uh, even more diligent around how your messages are coming across. Yes, every email right now is starting with, I hope that you are safe and your family as well. Uh, but honestly, if you are sending a networking email to someone, and I've received some of these, you know, um, the tone is just not right. If you're sending a networking email to someone who, say, has a loved one who is sick right now or is extremely stressed out and balancing from home and, you're, and you come off as demanding or you come off as inauthentic, um, I think this is really a time to make sure that you're really reading your emails with the tone of how is this going to yes. come across to someone if they are in a really challenging situation. I had a situation a few weeks ago where, you know, I actually had a guest on the show who very recently after the show, she contracted COVID-19 and, you know, right. and I, and I was not aware of that. And I was sending her follow-up emails, you know, saying, Hey, you know, promote the show. Here's the link. Here's a photo for this. And then, you know, I didn't hear back and I followed up and I said, you know, how, how come I haven't heard back? Yeah. And she said, Oh, you know, I, I'm recovering from COVID-19. And so that was really an eye-opening moment for me in that, okay, you don't have visibility into what people are doing. So I think for networking, yes, everyone is at home and everyone wants to help, but you have to also be really strategic about how you're messaging things and being sure that you're being empathetic to the fact that this is a really challenging time for everyone. Isn't that true though? Because I think there's something, um, there's a dissonance between how personal all of this is. Like you have a window into everybody's home. Right. <laughs> Tipping mine at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and and extraordinary people's homes. I, I was watching a thing. Um, the National Theatre in London did a fundraising pub quiz the night before last. And Mirren and Sir Ian McKellen and all these amazing. And you could see their living rooms. And when <laughs> does that ever? But that that I think is it's complicated because it makes you, on the one hand, feel more personally connected with the person you're talking to but yeah. on the other hand we still have a physical distance and you still don't really know what people are, are going through yeah yeah so i think there's a couple of things to say there me personally i'm an open book i'm an extrovert i i'm you know i, I frequently have colleagues over for for a drink you know I'm, I'm happy to open up my home to people at work but i do think it's important to note that there are a lot of people who are not comfortable with that yeah you know there was uh, we had someone share a, a woman share on 
LinkedIn that, you know, she's in an apartment with uh, several, co several uh, roommates right now. And the only place that she can take Zoom calls is her bedroom. And she really doesn't want her boss to see her bedroom. Gotcha. And, she, and it's something that's very personal to her. And so I think acknowledging that, and if you are a manager and you are in a situation, if you have someone who comes to you and says, you know, is it okay if we just take this by phone? I think that you have to be respectful of that right now. But what I would also say is, in terms of the, the interactions that you're having like this, uh, you have to be transparent and authentic with yourself that you do not know. Even though you see, you know, Debbie's lovely living room, I'd love to be there right now with a glass of wine right now. You know, you there can have be... a picture background on Zoom, someone said. And of course they're right. Yes. Never seem to quite... And also it seems a bit, I don't know, I would feel weird. We do a lot of this and I would feel quite odd having a, like, a fake picture in the background I don't know yeah how people feel about it yeah I mean that's a great tip I think you could have a picture background but whether you have a picture background or you're seen into someone's world if you don't you have no idea what's going on behind the zoom screen or behind the you know the door back here um mm -hmm. there could be something really challenging happening and so you know if, if you're about to maybe uh, you know send feedback negative feedback you know uh, to to a colleague you know think really critically about uh, what are you responding to? Were they short with you in a meeting and you're upset about that? Well, maybe it's instead of coming back and saying, hey, you were really short with me in that meeting, what's going on? Be like, hey, I, I, you know, I noticed that, you know, that meeting didn't come out the way that I wanted it to. How are you doing? Um, I think like understanding and, and being really empathetic with your colleagues right now is, is really important because coming out of this, I'm sorry, I, I, I hosted a, a session with a bunch of re, uh, recent college grads who are like in their first job uh, since, since going to college. And I had one, one, one girl ask me, I really wanna stand out at this time. I really wanted my performance to be great. And I'm really stressed out because you know, I, I don't know how to do that. And I told her, and what I want to tell people on the stream is that all people are gonna remember coming out of this pandemic is how you treated them and how they made you feel during this time. So if you're stressed out and focused on, I wanna make sure I'm excelling at work and that is putting just a mental stress load on yourself, I would focus that energy on performance and put it more towards how are you interacting with your colleagues what are they going to, how are they going to feel about you as a coworker coming out of this? And I think that that is more strategic than focusing on performance and the former. But isn't that great advice for life that generally people <laughs> don't really remember what you do or say, but they do remember how you make yeah. them feel. Yeah, exactly. And now we've had two types of questions just coming through. So maybe oh, I just greet them. I think there's one um, lot around, do we feel or how do we feel that the world will change post COVID? And do we feel that many of the topics that we've discussed, equal pay, flexible working, um, diversity in the workplace will become more front and center? Or is that just wishful thinking? I don't think it's wishful thinking. And obviously I, I talked to a set of leaders who are thinking progressively about these issues. So my data set is, is a little bit biased. Uh, but, you know, if you think about, you know, one of the examples that I wrote about recently, um, you know, Arnie Sorensen is the CEO of Marriott. And when this crisis began, he posted a video on LinkedIn. He's a CEO, you know, one of the largest companies in America, in the world. And he posted this video on LinkedIn. And in the video, when he was talking about the difficult decision he had to make to furlough and lay off a very large percentage of his hotel employees, he cried. He cried in the video and then he posted it on LinkedIn and millions of people saw it. That to me was a watershed. Yeah, it was amazing. That, that allows me to really I'll be positive about what the workplace can look at. If we have a CEO of a major corporation being that authentic and that transparent and that empathetic about the situation, I think moving out of this, we are going to see more leaders choosing those traits. And that's going to be a boon for working parents, working mothers, women who have been asking for this type of workplace for, for so mm -hmm. long. And so I think the best companies and the companies that are going to get the best talent out of this 
are going to be more accepting of flexible work. They are also going to be using this time to ensuring that they're building diverse teams and not ensuring that the, the portions of their workforce that they are letting go do not skew one direction or another in a specific type of way. And I think that's the opportunity coming out of this. And I think, you know, when I'm reporting, you know, as much as I've been loving reporting just on COVID-19 for the past eight weeks, when we do get out of this and I get to revisit these issues in full force, I think we're going to see a lot more demand and more movement towards equity. Isn't that an interesting topic around, back to our earlier conversation around leadership and what it means. So I, I, as I think I told you, Caroline, when we did that interview, yeah. um, you know, it was definitely the worst day of my career, um, having to um, furlough so many of our team, both UK and US, and um, and I've dealt, you know, I've been around the blocks. I've dealt with a lot of stuff. To your point on 2008 and uh, 2000, even when I yeah. was running my first business, and I've never cried at work. Um, but the day that I had to do that big um, thing uh, was um, was like nothing else I'd ever experienced, and it was very, very tearful for me. And I felt really self-conscious about it. Um, sorry, someone's telling me I'm covering the mic. Am I still covering the mic? No, you're good now. Yes? Yes. <laughs> sorry, if you could see what I was doing, I'm sort of standing on one leg trying to get enough charge in the corner of my room and I don't dare unplug it. In case I love it. it collapses. Uh, anyway, um, I, yeah, I think it really did, um, I found it very uncomfortable. But having had this time at home to reflect on what leadership is and actually what leadership is as a woman because we I think are very much taught to manage our emotion to manage it positively so there's a lot of leadership traits that are female but the tough stuff you tend to have to put your game face on and deal with it and I think experiencing something um, that felt so emotional and publicly displaying that was actually quite a turning point for me in terms of how I think about leading personally right um, Right. Another set of questions are about money, which, you know, is always a massively um, hot topic whenever we, um, we we raise it on an Instagram live or with our community. And I think the, the questions are around how do I make decisions about investing? Mm. Um, who do I go to? How do I think about it? How am I comfortable with it? Uh, and again, I know you, you flagged you're obviously not a financial advisor, but I know that you, um, it's a topic that gets covered on LinkedIn and that you have talked and written about it in the past. If you were to try and give, not, you know, chair tips or anything, but how, how do women get comfortable with this topic of managing and owning their own money? What would you say? So, yeah, I'm not going to say, you know, invest in Bitcoin right now or make sure, and make sure and buy shares of Zoom. That's definitely not my, my expertise. I would say that, you know, this, I don't, this is the first thing that came to mind. Um, when I was uncomfortable, I wanted to, I didn't know anything about wine at one point. And I, I realized that I didn't know anything about wine because I would go to a restaurant and I would take a picture of the menu and send it to my now husband and say, what glass of wine should I, should I get? And several years ago, that started bothering me. And I, I ended up being able to meet this master sommelier. And I asked him, I said, you know, I don't know anything about wine. Uh, how do I, how should I, what, do, what are your tips for learning more about wine? And he looked at me and said, well, how did you study in school? And I said, well, I made flashcards and I read a lot. And he's like, it's the exact same thing. So if you're someone right now who's not comfortable with investing, I think you don't know what you don't know. And there are so many great resources, both on and off LinkedIn. And I'm sure Albright has some great resources as well, where you can educate yourself. And I think that that is the number one thing is, of course, you're going to be uncomfortable with investing if it's something that you don't know anything about. Um, and I'm not a master psalm and wine yet, but I do have, you know, notebooks filled with notes. So about wine and I can now order my own glass of wine. It's the same thing with investing your money. If you're constantly going that, you know, to your partner or someone else to make those decisions, you're never going to be comfortable with it. And so being curious, and I think asking for information is one. And then I think the other thing is, is like really having, a, a, you know, in terms of what to do right now with your money amid this crisis, I think that yes, the markets are uncertain, and it could be tempting to pull money out of the markets if you have it in. I'm hearing from most 
most financial experts is that this turbulence will go away, the markets will rebound, we rebounded from every recession. So if you have the opportunity to keep your money in, into things, you know, that's the best strategy that I've been hearing from a lot of a lot of executives. I love it. And start small, as somebody um, has just written. Right. Um, Caroline, thank you so much. I feel like you and I could go for hours. I feel like my phone will not be able to go for hours. <laughs> so for that and for many reasons, uh, it's been a long day. I'm going to be yeah. It was such a pleasure talking to you, my love. Let's make sure that we do it again. It was so great chatting. Um, please don't forget to sign up to albrightconnect.com for a full listing of events tomorrow. Uh, Anna will be speaking to the Women's Equality Party leader, Mandu Reid. And she is also leading a Zoom panel with Kelly Hoppum, Joe Elvin, and Melissa Obdebash. So we are putting it out there all day, every day. Um, really lovely to speak to you and hope to see everybody again soon. Bye-bye.